Bible trails The Son of God, He is near He chose to walk with us These tribal trails Hi and welcome to Tribal Trails. You're here with Dr. Gary Parker again and thank you for watching today. Welcome to the program, Gary. Thank you again. Pleasure to be with you. <laughs> we see around the world that everything is breaking down and evolutionists think that everything is building up. What do you think about that? Uh, I've got to give some the evolutionists some credit here. They recognize, uh, at least some of them do, a big conflict uh, between their belief in evolution that things are running up. They're getting better, developing bigger, better. In fact, that's one thing that attracted to me to evolution was that, you know, you evolutionary process and lots of time just makes things better and better and, and more and more variety, everything like that. It's an upward onward progress. And yet, you know, when I studied chemistry, we start talking about, you know, energy flow and the so-called laws of thermodynamics, you know, that's a big word, but it's a simple word, you know, thermo, you know, you think of temperature, heat, energy, uh, dynamic means flowing, motion, stuff like that. And so we're talking about the, the laws of energy flow. And uh, energy does flow, matter gets recycled. I'm done with a car about 20, 25 years after I buy it. <laughs> <laughs> it can still be recycled. There's still metal, there's still parts, there's still matter that can be reused, but not the gasoline. That was a one-way trip. Okay, gasoline went in, went out, did its job, that was it. And, uh, and so that's what uh, these laws of science are concerned with is energy flow and the, the so-called first law of thermodynamics, the first law of energy flow is it uh, matter energy, they can be converted to one another. You can annihilate matter and turn it into energy. That's Einstein's favorite equation, A equals mc squared. Uh, or uh, you can uh, turn energy back into matter, but the amount can't change. And so the total amount of matter energy in the universe is the same before and after. It's conserved. Well, boy, oh boy, that, that raises some eyebrows right there. Wait a minute. Uh, matter, matter energy can neither be created nor destroyed. How'd it get here? And uh, I had students watching a couple of famous evolutionists on a TV program one time, and uh, one of these fellows was saying, you know, yeah, you hear these Christians saying, you know, uh, uh, you know, okay, explain the Big Bang, explain evolution. Where did the matter come from to get it all started? You know, I'm waiting to hear his answer. And he says, well, when they ask you, you know, where did the Big Bang come from, just ask them where did God come from? And the audience all applauded. And I thought to myself, wow, he finally said something intelligent. <laughs> He's very famous, but he just made constant mistakes. You know, he really bungled a lot of the stuff, of even teaching evolution. He wasn't even getting the evolution right. But this time he nailed it. Because when you look at the universe, okay, either it's self-made, self-transforming, there is no God, there is no spiritual dimension, or... There is a transcendent creator God, a spiritual dimension, something beyond the merely material, uh, an eternal being with plan and purpose. Well, now, one of those at least could make sense. The other one can't. We know too much about matter and energy to think matter energy is eternal because it's still here. It hasn't worn down yet. And yet every reaction, first law is the total amount's the same. You can never come out ahead. The second law is every time a change occurs, and that's what evolution's all about, change. But every time a change occurs, you lose some useful energy, not energy. The amount of energy stays the same, but the quality deteriorates. It goes from useful energy that could do work to useless, random, chaotic heat motion that doesn't do anything anymore. And the amount of order uh, is continuously decreasing. Things are becoming more disorderly. Entropy, a measure of disorder, is increasing. 
And the scientists know this. In fact, they refer to the second law, this downhill drift from useful energy to useless, from order to disorder. And they call it time's arrow. And I, I read that book, Time's Arrow and Evolution, when I was trying to make up my mind between creation and evolution. And the, the author, was he was an evolutionist, but he says, you know, evolution's an arrow pointing upward. Things are getting better and building up. Time's arrow, the second law of thermodynamics, is pointing downward. <laughs> How do you get these two together? And I thought, boy, oh boy, if evolution's true, you have to be able to get those two things together. And I went through the whole book and he finally admitted they don't go together. It really looks like the second, if the second law of thermodynamics is perpetual downhill motion, just rules out evolution. He was an evolutionist, but he was looking for help. Somebody help me, how do we get over this? Especially if you're gonna claim evolution is supported by science. And so, wow, uh, that, was, that, that was a big deal. I mean, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not only a universal law of science, but it's a big doctrine of scripture. Uh, Hebrews 1 uh, puts it this way, uh, way ahead of scientific discovery. The Bible's all, God's way ahead of scientists. <laughs> okay. And uh, so Hebrews 1 says, the heavens are growing old and wearing out like a garment to be cast off. It's not just the earth that's running down. It's not just our bodies that are running down. Uh, you know, the whole universe is running down. In fact, even evolutionists talk about the heat death of the universe. Eventually, all that's left is random chaotic motion, useless energy, no order, uh, no predictability to the relationship among particles. And the Bible already said that. The heavens are growing old, wearing out like a garment to be cast off, is uh, one phrase. Hebrews, or excuse me, Romans 8, uh, Paul talks about the creation subjected to futility, the effects of time and chance, and a bondage to corruption, continuous breakdown and decay is the pattern. Not that God created it that way. Those things came in, you know, after man's sin. <laughs> and Second Peter says, you know, all just running down and eventually the, uh, the elements will melt with a fervent heat. And even the evolutionists say that it's the heat death of the universe. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. That's really interesting. The Bible already tells us that the world won't last forever. And Dr. Parker just explained that even science proves that this world is running out. So science proves what the Bible has already told us. Since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, this world is destined to end, as it's said in Revelation. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. But take heart, this is not the end of the story. Let's listen to what else Dr. Parker has to tell us about science evolution, and the hope that we can have. And so, boy, oh boy, it looks like uh, the best documented law of science that applies in all areas of science and related fields is saying no nope, evolutionist dream of upward onward progress is absolutely contradicted by the observation of science never contradicted that change by itself, things run down. And you say, well, how do evolutionists get around that? I thought, boy, oh boy, yeah, how do they? And for years, and Dr. Gish was the expert at doing this, <laughs> uh, but for years, evolutionists said, oh, that's an easy one. <clears throat> you know, the earth is an open system. What does that mean? Well, it means the sun is showering the earth with energy. So there's an outside source of energy that's showering the earth with so much energy. There's enough energy coming from the sun, you know, to power evolution. And I thought, is that right? And actually, I, I read an article one time that kind of startled me. Uh, it said the sun is actually losing, disintegrating, disappearing at the rate of four and a half million tons per second. Every second that goes by, the sun is four and a half million tons lighter than it was before. 
and I actually did a, did a quick calculation to see if there was any point in preparing for the next class. <laughs> it looked like the sun ought to be gone before the afternoon class. But the sun is so huge, uh, I, I, I was surprised myself. I redid the calculation several times. Disappearing, four and a half million tons per second, and it's so big, it could still last potentially, just mathematically, uh, you know, for two billion years. Wow. Okay, so God gave us an energy source that wasn't going to wear out anytime soon. That was kind of impressive. But does that solve the problem? See, a lot of people, and, and this is a, a warning to Christians. Uh, a lot of times Christians say, second law says that things uh, go from order to disorder uh, and that's it, evolution's impossible. Not quite. Okay, the second law says you can get all the order you want if you pay the price. Okay, and so if you have an outside energy source that, you know, makes energy available, then you can use the outside energy source. It'll lose a lot more energy than it gains, but the sun is showering us with so much energy that there actually is enough energy to power evolution. In other words, there is enough energy coming from the sun to put molecules together to make cells and cells together to make uh, bigger organisms. But there's a major flaw with that argument. And of course, I had to face up to these when I began to do, <laughs> be doing creation evolution debates. Uh, one time, I was at the University of British Columbia. Okay, and this was a particularly uh, interesting kind of debate. Uh, because it was put on by the non-Christian students. Usually when I spoke at a university, the Christians, you know, invited me to come in and, you know, try to do battle against the evolutionists. But this time, uh, creationists were making so much progress, the evolution students wanted to bring in some uh, silly creationists and it embarrass them in public so people would quit believing in the Bible and creation. And so at one point I start talking about the second law. This is in the question time afterward. And one of the students comes down, takes a microphone out of my hand. It was a lot bigger than I was, so I thought, okay. <laughs> and he starts saying, you know, that uh, Christian, you know, this is silly, this is stupid. You know, the earth is an open system, the sun's shining on the earth, and you know. And so that means that second law argument is, is, doesn't do any good. And so then he finally went back and sat down and gave me the microphone back. And I thought, oh, let's see, open system. If you've got enough energy, then you can make evolution. Oh, well, yeah, you know, that's kind of neat. Because, you know, I ran out of gas one time. That's foolish. I should have got gas. I knew it was a long stretch road, but I ran out of gas. And it was a long way to walk, you know, to get gas. But I had a peanut butter sandwich. And I said, true or false, does a peanut butter sandwich have enough energy in it to run a car for 20 miles? And the answer, by the way, is, oh, yes, way enough energy in a peanut butter sandwich to run a car for 20 miles. And so I thought, oh, boy, look at that. It's an open system. I've got another source of energy. I can stuff that in a gas tank and save myself. Well, and, of course, people, even, even the evolution students begin to laugh a little bit. <laughs> it's not going to work. It's the wrong kind of energy. Well, okay, so... Let's say I caught myself at the last minute and realized that probably wouldn't work too good. I, and so I went down, you know, I walked and walked and walked with, and, and brought back, you know, some gasoline. Opened the hood, poured the gasoline on the engine, tossed in a match. Did that do it? Okay, there's enough energy in that gas to drive the car 20 miles. But it didn't drive the car 20 miles. <laughs> it blew it to bits. <laughs> And so I said, the open system argument is no good unless the energy you're talking about can be used to solve the problem you're trying to solve. Now, you're trying to use sunlight energy to put molecules together to make a living cell. Presumably, the coordinator of all these molecules is DNA. And you know, I ask him, what effect does DNA or does sunlight have on DNA? It destroys it. DNA is very sensitive to sunlight. It's awful. Okay, that's where you get skin cancer and all that kind of stuff. I said, so you could use, you know, the evolutionist argument for an open system and say, you know, my bills for going to school are too high. I'm going to do what green plants do. I'm just going to lie in the sun. 
and let the sunlight, you know, make all the food energy I need. I won't have to buy food anymore. Is it going to work? No. <laughs> You're going to have big bills for all kinds of aloe vera and suntan lotion and everything else. And so a raw source of energy can destroy or it can be used to power something if and only if you have a harnessing system. The energy's got to be appropriate for the problem that you're trying to solve. Just saying open system is just a statement of ignorance, and it is. Okay, so it's got to be the right kind of energy, and the evolutionists have never, it can't be sunlight. Sunlight's horribly destructive, and so we actually have all kinds of protective devices in our body to, to keep us from being damaged by sun, and plants have all kinds of ways, you know, of harnessing sunlight energy without, you know, having the negative effects, but that all has to be there in place to start with. And so the second law says you can get all the energy, all the order you want if you have an energy appropriately applied to the problem at hand. Can't just be random energy. Otherwise, you could toss a grenade in the car and that would any, you know, not any source of energy is going to work. And so, and I didn't get any response to that. Okay. So they realized, you know, well, hmm, that open system argument's not all that good after all. Other magic moments in my life, and God's given me several, was speaking at that uh, to a hundred students. That doesn't sound all that spectacular, but it was the top two students from each of the 50 states in America <laughs> at the National Science Youth Camp. And this was my second year as a creationist. And they said, send Parker to talk to these people. This was outside Washington, D.C. And so I'm, I worked hours and hours and hours. So I get a one hour talk and oh boy, I just worked my heart out on that. You know, and I, I go there and, and I give this talk to the hundred students. And uh, by the way, praise God, the students actually gave me a standing ovation. <laughs> I thought that was kind of neat. <laughs> yeah, that's happened a few times, but you know, I've also gotten other responses. <laughs> but in the audience, right there on the front row with his head in his hands, hating every word I was saying, was a Dr. Isidore Adler, one of the uh, NASA scientists who was, had recently debated a famous creationist, Dr. Gish. You know, he was very much opposed to creation, and he was very much in favor of evolution. And he just, he was, he just sat there. He didn't interrupt or he didn't heckle. And he stayed there after the students left, and a newspaper um, lady came over and started interviewing me, and Dr. Adler was still sitting there. And so we're going on, and I branched out. So my, my point had been made mainly on DNA and genetics and fossils, but I got a little adventurous and start, started talking about thermodynamics. And I said, uh, the open system argument doesn't work uh, unless you can show how sunlight can actually do the things evolution needs to be done rather than destroying them. And so uh, the second law is conditionally opposed uh, to the evolution of life on Earth. But I said it absolutely contradicts cosmic evolution because according to evolution, there is no outside energy source. A uh, famous evolutionist was famous for saying, you know, the cosmos is all there is, all mm. there ever will be, mm. uh, all there ever was. Uh, and, you know, or the cosmos is all there is, there ain't no more. There is no outside force. There is no spiritual dimension. There is no outside energy source. 
Well, the interviewer knew who Dr. Adler was. And, you know, he was just sitting there listening in. But she asked him, you know, what do you think about what Dr. Parker said about the laws of thermodynamics? And, uh, you know, he was a little bit startled. He wasn't planning to participate. But his answer was, well, he said, perhaps the second law didn't apply at all times and all places. And that gave me a chance to say, what? You can believe in evolution or the laws of science. You can believe in the Bible and the laws of science. <laughs> and one of the themes, one of the things I really want to get across is uh, science is not the enemy of the Christian faith. Science is our friend. Science is the ally of the Christian. Uh, science is a study of God's world and it supports what we read in God's word. It's actually science that has disproved all the tenets of evolution one at a time and all they do is shift over to a new view of evolution. You know, so they're unwilling, usually a scientist, once the theory has been discredited enough, tries a new theory. But if you're committed to no God, you're stuck with evolution, whether it works or not. And so, uh, but the Christians can rejoice. It, science is what, and one of the thrills of my life is that people have come to me, you know, I, I love science. I wanted to go into science, but I got into uni, university and they were just always talking about evolution and you've restored my love for science. Uh, yay, praise mm -hmm. the Lord. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of people we need. And science is not our enemy. Science is our friend. Science is evolution's enemy. And that's why, the, and by the way, when, uh, you know, after America lost the space race to the Russians, they said, we're never going to do that again. And they tried to make every kid in America, you know, an, uh, a scientist, you know, so the Russians wouldn't beat us anymore. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> so they decided to try to make every American a taxpayer to support science. Mm -hmm. And that was a pretty good idea, actually. But the, the way they tried to sell it was to say, no matter what we're doing, it's always a search for life's origin and the meaning and purpose in life from an evolutionary point of view. And that's, that's what we're getting now. And uh, so, uh, and that poisons real science. And so evolution is just, it's a belief about things that happened in the past, a unique series of events. And if you ask a scientist, well, you know, how old is the earth? How old is the universe? He said, well, I have my personal opinions, but if you're asking me as a scientist, I haven't got a clue. I'm a scientist. I study the present. I study things I can reserve, observe over and over again. Mm -hmm. Other people can make the same observations I do, come to the same conclusions. Other guys can check our observations. You know, if you're telling me what happened in the past, I can tell you what I know about radiation. I can tell you what I know about starlight and time. And what I can tell you is there's no way we can use that to determine the, the age of the universe or the earth. If you really want to know, you need a reliable witness to just up and tell you, well, what's the Christian have? Not only a reliable witness that was there that saw what happened, he was the one who made it happen. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. And he says, I created it in six days. I made it all very good. Wow. Best summary we can have, the best answer we can ever give is the word of the living God who made these very things and who cares for us. He paid the price for our sin to redeem us to a restored relationship. Wow. So as you can see, science and the Bible tell us about the decay of this world. There's no doubt about that. Today, there are even people trying to prepare themselves in case the world ends. But that won't help them in the end. Life in this world will be over. That doesn't sound too good, but we all think about the end and what it'll be like in the future. The good news is we can prepare for eternity. God has already prepared everything for us. In John chapter 14, verse 1 to 4, it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. 
believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Jesus Christ, God's Son, paid with his life for our sins. He already went to heaven and prepared everything for those who believe in him. We can be together with God in eternity. That's good news. Do you know if you'll be a part of that? If you're not sure, call us. We'd love to hear from you. Thinking of you appearing suddenly for me from out of nowhere, the greatest thing my eyes will ever see, just to hear you call me to the clouds to fly. Till last.